Thank you for the introduction and also thank you for the opportunity to give the seminar here. And I will talk about stochastic normalizing flows for inverse problems via a Markov chain. And this is a joint work with a couple of people, namely Fabian Altekrüger, Alex Denker, Paul Hagemann and Gabi Steidl. So my talk will consist out of two blocks. The first block is about normalizing flows. I will first say how, uh, what normalizing flows are in general. Then we will see how we can apply them for inverse problems. And afterwards, I will show two applications, how we can use normalizing flows and patch priors to solve inverse problems in an unsupervised way. In the second block of the talk, I will talk about stochastic normalizing flows. And for this, we will first represent normalizing flows as Markov chains. Then we will uh, see how stochastic comes into play. And we, we will again generalize this for in inverse problems. And finally, I will show some numerical examples. So let's start with normalizing flows. And what is a normalizing flow? Well, we have given some probability distribution Px here, which we want to approximate. And we want to approximate it by using a much simpler distribution, which is called the latent distribution, which is usually a standard Gaussian. And then we want to link these two distributions by a diffeomorphism, which is called T here. And uh, so more precisely, from a mathematical viewpoint, we want to learn a diffeomorphism T such that uh, our probability distribution Px is approximately given by the push-forward measure of T of the latent distribution. And once we have done this and we have found such a diffeomorphism, we can do two things with it. First of all, we can sample from uh, our approximation T push forward P set by just generating a sample Z from the latent distribution and putting it into our diffeomorphism. And the second thing that we can do is uh, we can evaluate the density of our approximation by the change of variables formula for probability density functions, which is more or less just a transformation formula. Okay, so what will this T be? This T will be a neural network, and for our analysis, we will require that T is invertible. So the question is, how we can, can we construct invertible neural networks? And as any neural network, uh, an invertible neural network consists of, of several layers here, and, uh, what, uh, and there are several architectures proposed in literature how we can uh, design layers which are by construction invertible. We mainly use uh, so-called directly invertible neural networks, which were proposed by Adizona and co-workers. And the basic idea is to split the input here into variables, put these two sub-variables into uh, some sub-networks, and combine these sub-networks in an intelligent form such that one can analytically write down the inverse here. There are yeah, there. Uh, so, so uh, in fact, for normalizing flow, it's usually just a neural network. We have somehow to parameterize the way uh, the class of all diffeomorphisms, and uh, we cannot parameterize the whole class, so we have to restrict to some sub subspace, and yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it depends what you call a neural network. If you, if, I mean, if you parameterize it in some way, we can call it a neural network, so <laughs> yeah. Okay, and there are also other ways to uh, to design such invertible layers uh, uh, as here. So there's lots of literature about it, but I don't want to speak too much about the architectures here today. So once we have fixed an architecture, the question is how to learn such a normalizing flow. And recall, we want to measure here the similarity of two probability distributions. And one way to do this is the kullback leibler divergence. The kullback leibler divergence of two measures, uh, Px and Py, is given by the expectation over the first measure Px of the logarithmic Radon-Nukodym derivative here, provided that this uh, Radon-Nukodym derivative exists. And if our measures Px and Py have uh, probability density functions, this Radon-Nukodym derivative is just uh, the quotient of uh, these two probability density functions here. And uh, the kullback leibler divergence has some nice properties. In particular, it's zero if the two probability distributions are equal. And otherwise, it's always greater than zero. But it's not a distance, so we don't have a triangular inequality. And uh, it's also not symmetric. And because it's not symmetric, we have two 
canonical ways how we can measure the similarity here. And these two canonical ways will yield two different loss functions which we can use for uh, normalizing flows. The first loss function uh, is often called the forward KL loss function here. And the basic idea is uh, to, to say, okay, our first measure will be the data distribution and the second measure will be our approximation. And then we can compute this loss function and what we obtain is some expectation over the data distribution px here and then only things which we can compute. So to train a normalizing flow with this loss function, we just need samples from our data distribution, from our original distribution to approximate it. But we don't need the density of the data distribution. And uh, one can see in this loss function that it penalizes samples from our data distributions which have a small probability under our reconstruction. So in fact, what will happen is that our reconstruction will contain all samples from our original distribution here, but we do not penalize the generation of unrealistic samples. So if I have such a multimodal distribution, a typical error will be that I have some mass here in between if I reconstruct it with a normalizing flow. Okay, as I said, there are two canonical ways to uh, combine, uh, to measure the similarity of our approximation, the data distribution. We can just interchange here the arguments. And uh, also then we can compute the kullberg leibler divergence. We don't have any longer the expectation over the data distribution here, so we don't need any longer samples from our probability uh, distribution we, which we want to approximate, but here appears the density of the data distribution. So in this case, we need the density, but no samples. And uh, now it vice versa penalizes samples from our reconstruction with a, a, a small probability under our data distribution here. So in fact, uh, the loss uh, will, so, so any sample from our reconstruction will be realistic, but uh, we don't penalize samples from the data distribution which are not covered from our reconstruction. So a typical error is mode collapse, which is also known from GUN, that if I want to approximate here multimodal distribution, that I just miss one of the modes. Okay, now we, we want to see how we can use normalizing flows for inverse problems. And f first of all, what is an inverse problem? And Bayesian inverse problem means that we have a random variable x here, which follows some prior distribution px, and we put it into an operator f and corrupt it by some noise. And this operator is usually not invertible or ill posed. And our goal from uh, of using our normalizing flow now is to reconstruct uh, the posterior distribution px given that y is one specific observation. And I have an example here if my prior distribution is given just by two Gaussians here, and I say, okay, I observe just one of the variables here, then uh, the posterior distribution will look, well, more shrinked in one direction, but in the other direction where I don't observe anything, it's just the same as before. Okay, now how can we use normalizing flows to reconstruct this posterior distributions? Well, the idea is that our normalizing flow now takes two arguments, one observation, observation y and one element from the latent distribution. And now the goal is that if I fix the observation y and take the push forward to the latent distribution, that I then obtain here our posterior distribution. And so for any observation y, the, if I fix the y here, our t has to be invertible and one can easily adapt this architecture just by putting this y also to these subnetworks here. And again, I can use two different loss functions here. So the forward KL loss function, where I have the posterior dif distribution as first argument in the KL and the reconstruction in the second argument. And as we do this for all Y, we have to add this expectation here in front of. And this yields a supervised loss function. So I need uh, data pairs from um, my ground truth and my observations to train this, but I don't know, I need any knowledge about the model, so I don't need the forward operator and I don't need the prior distribution. On the other hand, I can and just again interchange in both arguments here, and uh, this yields an unsupervised loss function, so, uh, so I don't need la labeled data pairs, but I need the forward operator and the prior distribution here. Okay, now I want to present two applications, how we can use normalizing flows at patch priors for unsupervised solution of inverse problems. 
And uh, for this, we first of all forget the Bayesian setting and say we have one observation Y, which is uh, generated by one ground truth, which is put in the forward operator and corrupted by some noise. And one a classic way to reconstruct the ground truth now is to, to use a variational model where we have here data term and a regularizer where the data term says uh, that our reconstruction has to fit to the, our observation. The regularizer has to say that uh, our images look re realistic. And now we want to learn this regularizer from data, but we say we have only very, very few data given. So uh, the idea is not to regularize the image itself, but to regularize small patches from the image. And uh, further, we will also adapt to a certain class of images, namely CT images, material microstructures, or textures, which have a much easier structure of textures than natural images. And uh, so how do we regularize the patches? The idea is we take a few training images and cut all the patches out of these training images, and then we learn a normalizing flow, which approximates the, di the distribution of all these images. And then, uh, once we have learned this normalizing flow, we uh, solve a variational problem where the, we first have some data term. And in the second part, we have the log likelihood of our patches, the sum of uh, the log likelihood of all our, our patches. So we want to have that all our patches look realistic. And in fact, this works very well if you do, do this. So, so here I have an example for super resolution. We have a high resolution ground truth and a low resolution observation. And here I have this patch normalizing flow. And uh, here there are two comparison methods which are both also unsupervised. And we s can see here that the image of the patch normalizing flow is sharp, is, well, slightly sharper than the other ones. But in the er er error measures, we see a significant difference here. And we can also apply it on computerized tomography. And here we have usually a Poisson noise, so the data term looks a little bit different. And uh, here we compare with the baseline filter back projection, which is, I think, often used. And also one unsupervised method and one supervised method here. And uh, we see, yeah? Yes, deep, uh, this is a deep image prior, yeah. And we see that our patch normalizing flow is very close to the supervised method, even though it's trained completely unsupervised. And it just needs six ground truth images, while the supervised method needs 35,000 ground truth images plus labels. So, yeah. And one can make the inverse problem even harder by using a limited angle tomography, where we just use some of the angles. And uh, then we also see that the very patch normalizing flow is much better th than the comparisons. But here I have to say that the supervised method is work in progress, so it's not probably what it can be trained better than we have done it so far. Yeah? Ah, the, the, the first one is a PSNR and SSEM, I, I think well known. And the LPIPS is something which. Uh, which is based on extracting features from uh, in a network which is trained for classification. So, so it uses deep features to, uh, and compares deep features of the reconstruction and the ground truth image. It's, yeah, it's a learning-based loss function, and I think yeah, it's often used in, uh, in such cases. Yeah. OK. And I have also a second application how we can use normalizing flows. And here, the, the idea is to construct another patch prior by saying, OK, an image, a texture-like image, can be represented by its uh, patch distribution, more or less. And uh, so we take an image x, we ex extract all patches from the image x and get, get vectors in maybe this 36-dimensional space. And then we create out of this image a measure mu x, which just sums up the direct measures of all of these patches here. And now the idea is to say, OK, I, take, uh, I want to solve my inverse problem, first again by such, such a variable version of problem. And here I have first the data term. And as a regularizer, I use the Wasserstein 2 distance of my reconstruction and some other image, which comes from the same material or from the same texture or something like this. And uh, for, we can do this 
with this variational problem here. We can use this regularizer to train a neural network in an unsupervised way where we say, okay, we just want to map our input onto uh, the minimizer onto of this variational problem. And what we can do now also is to say, okay, we use this regularizer to define a prior distribution here. And then we take here an inverse problem and we train a normalizing flow using our backward KL, which uses the forward operator and the prior distribution, but no data, to uh, reconstruct uh, several di different images from which are realistic under our uh, prior distribution here. Okay, and now I have also some results for it. First of all, j just with the usual uh, variation of problem and the network here. And well, I d don't want to say too much about it. It's a little bit sh sharper than the other ones and okay. A very good property of it is uh, if I s say I don't know the operator exactly, but I use something slightly different, then these methods are still give still a reasonable reconstruction where while other, the, all the other comparisons break completely here. Good, but okay, w w w the most interesting thing I think is that we can now do uncertainty quantification. So given one low resolution image here, we can uh, sample several images from our uh, posterior distribution because we have trained a normalizing flow on it. And we can see that these different reconstruction have uh, different properties. So this connection here is sometimes closed, sometimes open, and also this connection here uh, in the bottom is sometimes closed and sometimes open. So we can really do uncertainty quantification here. Okay, now we have seen that we can do great things with normalizing s flows. So one could wonder why do we even need stochastic normalizing flows? And uh, th the problem is the following. If I have a multimodal data distribution as these ACE modes here, and a unimodal prior distribution, for example, a standard Gaussian here, and I train a normalizing flow with a reasonable number of parameters, it usually happens something like this here. So we capture roughly the uh, data distribution, but there are always these connections between the modes here. And we have to increase the number of parameters and uh, the training effort a lot to get a more reasonable reconstruction here. And in fact, one can also quantify this theoretically. I d didn't write the exact theorem here, but it's a result by Paul Hagemann and Sebastian Neumeyer which says uh, roughly if I train a normalizing flow from a unimodal distribution to a multimodal distribution, then the Lipschitz constant of this flow has to explode. And as we know that learning neural networks with large Lipschitz constants is really hard, we obtain that normalizing flows have difficulties to approximate multimodal distributions, which is a problem. And to overcome this, we want to use stochastic normalizing flows so we want to uh, combine these deterministic transformations of a normalizing flow with some non-deterministic steps. This is something which was first done by Wu, Köhler, and Nui, which uh, have proposed to use uh, first some normalizing flow and then some stochastic sampling methods, then again normal, uh, normalizing flow and something like that. So they combined deterministic flows with stochastic sampling steps here. and. Uh, we can also include something more sophisticated m methods. We could, could include VIEs and something like that. And in fact, uh, I have here a small numerical example which, uh, which shows that this helps. So we have here in, in the alterna an alternation of normalizing flow transformations and uh, stochastic transformations. And we can reconstruct here this multimodal smiley here, which is the density here. OK, but uh, Wu, Noe, and Köhler here had uh, the problems to describe mathematically what they have even done there, even uh, uh, though it works very well numerically. But uh, we have somehow to define what we are doing here, and uh, we will use the uh, we will use the tool of Markov chains here. So, okay, first of all, I will uh, say what a Markov chain is and how um, we can represent normalizing flows as Markov chains. And for this, we are introduce first Markov kernels. A Markov kernel is a mapping which maps from the RD and the Borel algebra, algebra from RD into the interval 0, 1, such that it's measurable in the first argument and a probability measure in the second argument. So given another probability measure mu and RD, we can define such a product bit between mu and uh, Markov kernel in such a way here. And the intu intuition be behind it is to, to saying, okay, we uh, first sample one point from our measure mu 
And then this point selects the probability measure from the Markov kernel from which we sample the second point. So it's kind of a two-stage experiment. And I think the most important example of such a Markov kernel is the regular conditional distribution, which decomposes the joint distribution of two random variables x and y, first into the distribution of the random variable x and such a Markov kernel. So a Markov kernel, uh, this conditional distribution, is kind of a transition rule, how we come from our uh, random variable x to our random variable y in a non-deterministic way. And now we can also connect several of these uh, Markov kernels together, and what we obtain is a Markov chain. So a sequence of random variables is a Markov chain. If we find Markov kernels here, th such that the joint distribution of, our, uh, of all of our random variables decomposes in uh, the distribution of the first random variable and several of these Markov uh, kernels. So uh, a finite Markov chain is kind of a multi-stage experiment, which means we first sample uh, random variable x0 from our first random variable, and then we uh, use always the sample xt minus 1 to select the probability measure to sample the next uh, uh, element from our Markov chain. And uh, now, what does all this stuff has to do with normalizing flows? When we have a normalizing flow, which consists of, uh, of several layers, we can uh, induce two Markov chains, the first one is to uh, model the forward process, how we come from the latent distribution to the data distribution by just sampling x0 from uh, our latent distribution. And then we generate the Markov chain by uh, uh, applying all the, la the layers of our normalizing flow here. And what co comes out is our approximation here. And the same thing we can do, uh, can we do backwards? So we can start with the data distribution and apply the inverse layers and the, we end up by our approximation for the latent distribution now. And uh, in this case, these Markov kernels, uh, these transition rules look very simple. I mean, the transitions are even deterministic in such a way. So the Markov kernels which apply here are such uh, uh, Dirac measures which are one if we are in the correct point and zero otherwise. Okay, uh, now, we want to make this Markov chains uh, a little bit less boring to uh, and use a stochastic normalizing flow. And we define a stochastic normalizing flow now as a pair of Markov chains, which uh, one Markov chains modeling the forward pr process, how we come from the latent distribution to the data distribution, and one Markov chain which uh, models the backward uh, process, how we come from the data distribution to the latent distribution. And to have this, we need a few technical properties. First of all, we want that all of these uh, random variables have densities as their own. And then we want that our Markov chain X, X really starts in the latent distribution and then has this Markov chain structure. And in the same way, we want that our other Markov chain starts at the data distribution and has also this uh, structure here. And the third property is something, uh, some technical property which we require to derive a loss function, which is an uh, absolute continu continuity property of such conditional distribution with respect to each other. And important is here that th they have only to be absolute continuous with respect to each other and not with respect to the Lebesgue measure, because we have seen that this were such Dirac uh, measures so far, so they aren't absolute continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And in fact, this was also the point where the analysis of the other authors bro was broken. And okay. Now, seeing this definition, one could wonder what is even trainable now at this Markov chain. And uh, what is trainable are these kernels, uh, how we come from xt minus 1 to xt. We have seen uh, in, in the, the case of a normalizing flows, they were given by such a normalizing flow mapping, by such an invertible mapping, which had some parameters. So the parameters are hidden in these Markov kernels, and we want to learn these Markov kernels. And we have already seen one way to do it, namely by a normalizing flow. Okay, so there are also other ways to do this. And uh, one of them uh, is a stochastic sampling method, namely the, the so-called Lagevin layer. In some applications, we already know roughly where we want to come out, so, so the density of the data distribution, or some other density which is close to it, which we call now the proposal density. 
And if we have given such a proposal density, we can say, okay, we just do a gradient descent step with respect to the negative logarithm of the proposal uh, uh, density and add some noise here. And in this case, uh, these Markov kernels are just given by such a normal distribution here. And this has also an interpretation. Namely, uh, if we connect many of these layers, then we get an explicit Euler discretization of a famous stochastic differential equation, namely the overdamped Langevin dynamics here. And uh, it is known that if, if we uh, run a Langevin dynamics, that then it has a stationary distribution, which is a proposal density. So if we apply such a Langevin layer, we can expect that we even uh, go closer to this proposal density. In the same way, we can use a Metropolis Hastings layer, which is just another uh, stochastic sampling algorithm. And this is based on uh, acceptance rejection procedure. So we, we say we take our old sample, we perturb it a little bit by noise, and then we either accept it or we reject it uh, based on some statistics with, which comes, uh, which is again uh, defined by this proposal density here. And also here we can derive the Markov kernel at here and yeah, and, uh, and we can see that this is one step of the metropolis Hastings algorithms which also approximates this proposal density here. So now the question arises how we want to train this uh, stochastic normalizing flows. And uh, training such as for what we have done before was to say, okay, we take our approximation of our uh, data distribution and the data distribution, and we take the KL divergence here. Unfortunately, we cannot compute this any longer in the case of stochastic normalizing flows. Therefore, we say, okay, the data distribution is just the last element of one of our Markov chains, and then we uh, minimize the KL divergence uh, between the whole paths here. And then we can compute the loss function, which just requires the sample from one of these paths of the, of, the, of the Markov chains. And then we get here some loss function, which contains a latent distribution and some terms here. And in fact, we can compute the, these terms for any of these layers. Okay. Uh, and at the beginning, I said something about variational autoencoders, and in fact, variational autoencoders are a special case of normalizing flows. But first of all, what is a variational autoencoder? And for this, I start with what is an autoencoder. Well, an autoencoder uh, is a pair of two neural networks, E and D, where E maps from uh, a high dimensional space into a lower dimensional space, and D maps vice versa. So, and at the end, an autoencoder is trained to be the identity on the training data. So it's a kind of a data dimensional reduction technique because of course we have here a bottleneck which gives us a low dimensional representation of the data. And now the idea of a variation autoencoder is to say, okay, we don't map any point from the high uh, dimensional space to one point in the low dimensional space, but to, the, uh, to a whole distribution in the low dimensional space. And this is exactly the the uh, notion of Markov kernel. So we can say we defi define our uh, a decoder which maps uh, to, a to a normal distribution in, uh, in the latent space, and we can vice versa go from the latent space back to the data space using a Markov kernel here. And then we can derive this loss function here once for stochastic normalizing flows. And if one computes this loss function, what comes out? is exactly the evidence lower bound which is used for training variational autoencoders here. So stochastic normalizing, f f so, so variational autoencoder is in fact only a one layer stochastic normalizing flow here. Okay, so now I want to, to, to say how we can again incorporate inverse problems here. And in, in fact, this is again the notion of our inverse problem. So we have a random variable x which follows the prior distribution and is feed into the uh, forward operator and corrupt by some noise. And now we can do more or less do the same thing as for uh, normalizing flows. So uh, we just adapt the conditions from a stochastic normalizing flow to a conditional stochastic normalizing flow by saying, okay, we uh, construct a a density, uh, we construct a sequence of two random var variables from x0 to xt and from yt to y0. And if we say we, we condition them on being the random variable y to be our observation, then it should be, a, uh, what comes out should be again a stochastic normalizing flow. 
for each observation y. And uh, so we have to adapt the conditions here. Uh, so if we feed the y into one of the density, we, we want to have a density. If we, we want that these conditional distributions are Markov chains, and yeah, we want to have a similar technical assumption to derive our loss function. And as for usual deterministic de de normalizing flows, we just uh, add this y here to the probability measures, uh, which uh, are fed into the KL distributions, and what appears here is just an expectation before uh, the, the rest of the loss function, which is then the same as before. And here I have a, a small example, which uh, again with such smileys, so, so we have here the condition, how happy the smiley is, and based on this condition, we generate once uh, the smiley with a stochastic normalizing flow, and just with the usual normalizing flow, and we see that this really makes a difference here. Okay, now I have some more numerical examples, which are a little bit higher dimensional, but yes? No, I, I don't need any invertible map anymore more here. So, so the idea is, so, so I mean, the idea is what I can do is to say I make a deterministic transformation, and then I need an uh, invertible map to go backwards. But what I can also do is uh, uh, say, uh, using something like a variational autoencoder, which maps uh, to a distribution in the next r random variable or something like that, and then I have to define a notion what, uh, what how I'm going backwards. And in fact, the loss function says that the backward process has to model somehow the inverse of, uh, of the... It's not? Yes. Yeah, but, well, you, you don't have to model a compression. Of, of course, uh, then it's somehow, if you don't reduce the space with the variational autoencoders, it's, some, uh, it's often considered in literature then under the name diffusion models or something like that. And uh, yeah, so of course you can uh, c compress the data, but in fact you don't have to. And all the analysis of a variational autoencoder doesn't need this compression. Yeah. But yeah, you can also do compression with it. Okay, for the numerical examples, so the numerical examples for stochastic normalizing for the stochastic normalizing flows will be proof of concepts examples. So I don't won't show any more great images now. But uh, the f first example is uh, uh, there we wanted to have somehow a ground truth. So we wanted to evaluate our experiment. And one nice property here is to, to say. Uh, okay, if I choose as a prior distribution such a Gaussian mixture model here, and uh, I apply a linear inverse problem, then the posterior distribution is still a Gaussian mixture model. So the great thing on considering a linear inverse problem using a, a Gaussian mixture model as prior distribution is that we can evalu evaluate our experiments in a good way. And therefore, we start with a mixture model as prior distribution, a di diagonal ma matrix which uh, has diagonal values which go to zero, such uh, that it's uh, really an inverse problem, and s s some, no some Gaussian noise here on it to g get our Gaussian mixture model here. And then we applied different combinations of uh, normalizing flows and our stochastic layers. So this one is just the stochastic normalizing flows, and this is th these images are histograms of the of the samples which come out. So so th this here on the diagonal and such of uh, such potential maps which are not here on the diagonal. And here we can see that uh, if we use a Gaussian, uh, just the normalizing flow, then our reconstruction, which is blue here, is not able to separate these modes from each other. While other of these uh, combinations, which now com co combine a normalizing flow with some sampling methods, which uses a variational autoencoder, and uh, other combinations of all of these uh, do usually better of that. And we also uh, noted the wasserstein waden distance between the generated samples here. And here, I think, uh, combining a variational autoencoder with some sampling steps was doing the best, but also the normalizing flow combined with it, yeah, 
was also very good. But uh, the takeaway message is that combining uh, the, them is work somehow. And I have also a, se a second uh, numerical example, which comes from scatterometry, which is a problem from physics. I, and I have to admit, I don't understand either what happens th there, but uh, for me, it's just an inverse problem. We have uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, data, which somehow describes the geometry of an object in physics. And uh, this somehow generates a diffraction pattern, which is then, <laughs> then observed. And this is an inverse problem. And we have here such mixed noise of additive and multiplicative Gaussian noise. And the forward operator here is known but it's given by a partial differential equation. So uh, the samples from a ground truth, w w where ground truth here means that we sampled them by Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which takes really a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> and here we can also see that the normalizing flow with uh, some sampling steps does best here. Okay, so now I'm, w w let me conclude the talk. We have seen that normalizing flow are a really powerful tool to f for many problems as density estimation, generating samples, solving inverse problems, and even uncertainty quantification. But uh, in the case that we have a multimodal data distribution, uh, normalizing flows might fail. And then we overcome it with stochastic normalizing flows, which are, have to be, be described by Markov chains. And uh, once we have done this, we find many concepts which are done in literature again as stochastic normalizing flows. Okay, so I'm at the end of my talk. I have here written the references where this talk is based on, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>